percentage wise, this number isn't real, but it's been tested a lot and it holds up. The sweet spot is about 4% greater than your skill level. So when the challenge is about 4% greater than your mm -hmm. skill level, that's the zone. The problem with peak performance with that's the top guys- That's not a guys, lot. That's, yeah, that's the point, is it's yeah, not a lot. Yeah, especially in our community, yeah, which people just not, go to, they no, blow up. They, they, your community, they go to, they blow yes. up. And so here's the, this is very sports specific thing. Um, I did, the coolest thing that got done was at Angel Fire Bike Park, where we measured every one of the jumps. So we could, at the start of the season, we said, okay, you're comfortable on a 12 foot gap jump and you're comfortable on a 15 foot tabletop or your blah, blah, all that stuff. So we could start to measure increments and how much you push and blah, blah. And we just, it was still wasn't the best. I, we've never published it. It's not a real study. I mm -hmm. still don't think it's real science. I just think it's more information. But what we found is the coolest thing in the world. When people stay in that 4% sweet spot, you, I don't know if this happens in CrossFit, but in skiing, mountain biking, whatever, you know, the start of the season, it was like two or three days, four days, where you're just sort of getting used to the, the speed, the work, the effort. But then you get a couple of really deep flow states that basically show you a whole new level of performance that might be possible for you. And then you spend about three months learning to do all that shit without the flow. And then you get another deep, then you leveled up and you get another deep flow state that shows you what's next, right? And that's, the, that's most of the process of athletic improvement for most people most of the time, unless... We did what we did, where you stay in that 4% sweet spot, which most of the time required me to back off my natural instincts. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, it wasn't that I right. wasn't pushing hard enough. It was, I literally had to come way back. And what I discovered is, and what most of the people in the study group discovered is that there was no plateau. You kept getting flow state after flow state after flow mm -hmm. state after awesome. flow state. And there wasn't a plateau. And the level of um, progress you would make over like the course of a season was unlike anything anybody had made. We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live Five, on the run, four, always chasing, three, never stop. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence, a special episode. Uh, we've got author Stephen Kotler here with us. How are you, Stephen? I'm really good. How are you guys? Good. Thank you so much uh, for, for making some time for us. Stephen, for those folks who don't know, is a New York Times bestselling author, an award-winning journalist, and the executive director of the Flow Research Collective. He's one of the world's leading experts on human performance and the author of merely 13 books, <laughs> including yeah. The Future is Faster Than You Think, Stealing Fire, The Rise of Superman, Bold, and Abundance, as well as the latest book, which is out now. I think it's actually dropping the day that we publish this episode called The Art of Impossible, A Peak Performance Primer. So, Stephen, the first thing I wanted to ask is, given your, um, given all of the work that you've done, given all of the books you've published, given all the work you've done from through the, the Flow Research Collective, why this book and why now? Where does it sort of fit into the canon um, that you've been working on? And why did you feel like, I'm sure that you have lots of ideas, lots of possible projects to work on. Why was this the one that came out in the, you know, at the time that it did? Well, good questions. Um, big picture, my core subject has always been, what does it take to accomplish the impossible, right? That's the question I've asked for most of my career. And usually when you see, like, the we'll talk about capital I impossible now, like something yeah. that's never been done before, right? Um, and this could be intellectual impossibles like Einstein's theory of relativity. We could – cultural impossibles, Rosa Parks sitting at the front of the bus. It could be athletic impossibles, 400 miles, et cetera. But I've spent my career doing that, right, studying those moments in time when the impossible became possible and using the tools of neuroscience predominantly and psychology a little bit to figure out what's going on in the brain and the body when people are performing at, at, at this level. And that's what I've essentially done for 30 years. Now, whenever you see the impossible become possible, you tend to see people finding, you know, using new kinds of technology, accelerating disruptive technology. Uh, so I've written six books on accelerating disruptive technology and how to harness it and et cetera, et cetera. And, and you see people expanding and extending human capability. And I've written six books on that side. 
What I've never done on the human capability side, but I did do with Bold uh, on the technology side is write a playbook. Mm. Here, right? So 30, for 30 years, I've been looking at this stuff. For 30 years, people have been pretty much since my very first book on flow came out saying, Stephen, please write a how-to, please write a how-to, <laughs> please write a... And what I've been saying all along is I would love to, but the science isn't there. The science, everything I, everything I do has to be led by the science. And one of the answers to why now is that over the past five to six years, neural imaging, various, ver- various neurological techniques have advanced so quickly that we are seeing deeper and deeper into the brain and we have a full picture of this. And secondly, as you probably noticed from the Art of Impossible, it's sort of the full suite of cognitive peak performance. Nobody's managed to do that yet. One, because the science just started showing up and I, because of the work we do at the Flow Research Collective, where we're literally studying the neurobiology of the stuff with Stanford and USC and UCLA and whatnot, we're, at the, we're working on the cutting edge. We're seeing some of this stuff first and we're seeing it in a bigger picture. Also, because I work on flow, the state of optimal performance, flow amplifies almost everything, right? Motivation, productivity, grit, creativity, learn on and on and on. It's, it's literally like 12 to 14 things long, depending on how you're adding it up. So I've had to learn all those subjects along the way just to get good at the thing that I want to do mm. and understand it. And as a result, all this science got done. And because of the work we're doing at Flow, because it demands that we look at the big picture, because that's what we're working on, um, we saw all this stuff. And I was like, wait a minute, this is all a sequence. It's all, of course it is, right? It's all a system. It's all connected together. And, you know, it allowed me to craft a how-to, which is part A. Part B was, I think at this point in terms of training flow, I don't think there's anybody on the planet who's done more of it than I have. Um, Somebody calculated that I've taught like a quarter million people at this point. Um, It's a lot of people. And What I learned over and over and over again is flow is fantastic. And if you use the neurobiology of flow, it is totally trainable. You can get huge spikes in flow. But if your interest is sustained long-term peak performance over a very long period of time, flow is absolutely necessary, but it's not sufficient. It's a Mm -hmm. a full suite of things. In fact, what the major fault that I was seeing is you could train people up in flow, but all the things that flow amplifies – if you don't actually have those skills locked in, your foundation isn't stable enough to handle the acceleration of flow over time. And then you've got a real problem, which was early days of training people, I could create a shitload more flow, super pleasurable, joyous, ecstatic state where performance goes way up for a lot of people, and then it would return to baseline. We'd get 70% boost in flow. Three months later, they've got like 5% boost in flow. And since flow is underpinned by the most addictive neurochemistry on earth, if you're creating a bunch of that in clients and customers and then you're taking it away, yeah. they're not happy, right? And <laughs> yeah. I don't blame them. You right? took the supply so away. You took the supply away. And so I was trying to solve that problem at the same time all the science was done. I started to realize, well, wait a minute, this is the same. These are the same things. And the, there's one more answer to the question of like, why now and why this book? And, and it's, it's this. I've had just the most privileged view of the world over the past 30 years. I've gotten to see the most amazing things in the world. And the people who have done world-changing things have been in the subjects of all my books. Mm. But for every one person I met who ended up in the book, there were 100, 200, 300, 400 who were almost as talented, just as smart, had that much saved the world potential, and couldn't get out of their own way. Couldn't get out of their own way for really like sort of simple foundation. I mean, it's really basic biological reasons. It's what trips all of us up. But I, like, I, like I can't save though. I don't know how to solve an energy crisis in Africa. I can't do that. I can't fix water shortages in you know the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what I can do. But this, that wasn't the stuff. I thought people would get derailed by the entrepreneurship or the technological challenges. And it's not that at mm. all, right? I remember once talking to a very high level member of Singularity University, and I was talking about all the companies because nobody's got a better view on technology and entrepreneurship than they do. And they said, well, why has it been so hard to really pick the winners? And they said, because we didn't factor people into the equation enough, 
right? Like yeah. over and over and over again. And I was like, well, okay, I may not know how to do all that stuff as well as you guys, but people like, this is what I do. And so I got, I just got sick and tired of like, we are in a world facing so many big colossal challenges. And one thing I can tell you from the tech side is we have all the solutions. It's about implementing them, cooperating, working together, working at our best, et cetera, et cetera. And I got really tired of watching people sort of trip over themselves. You know what I mean? In a sense, I wanted, I wrote this book and this is not a thing I can say out loud, so this is gonna sound awful, but I'm gonna say it <laughs> fucking anyways. But really when I, I like, this is the book you wanna like, think about the person in your life who could have the biggest, make the biggest dent in the universe if they could only stop tripping over their own damn feet. Yeah. Buy this book for them. That's like, that's what, you know what I mean? That's why Absolutely. I wrote this book. Um, and I hope that's what you guys got out of it also yep. since you, since you've read it. Yep. Yeah. I love, uh, love that Stephen. Um, our listeners are in our, our community, our core group of people are, um, they're going to eat this up. They're looking for that. Um, they're not just the people that need to get out of their own way. They're go-getters themselves. They are, um, people that are trying to chase excellence is the term that we use. Like we're trying to make, if, if it's not put a dent in the universe, it's, um, you know, make a big loud bang somewhere. I think what's really powerful about the book is when I think of a flow state, and I am so excited about this conversation because working with uh, the level athletes that I do, this is what I'm trying to drive home all the time. Like if the he or she who spends the most time in flow wins, it's like, if we can just get there, we've hacked the system. So when I think about a flow state, I'm expecting, as you alluded to a little bit, the neurochemistry, the brain stuff, the alpha, theta, the gamma, like all like the prefrontal cortex versus, I, and really quickly, I'm, I'm expecting to get overwhelmed because I don't, I'm not a scientist. I'm, I'm, I'm a, a, a dumb gym owner. And <laughs> what, I, what I appreciate about the book is, and I mean this in the most, complimentive way possible is the simplicity to it. It's not what you expect when you're talking about getting your brain in a certain state. And it's things that we talk about on this podcast all the time, purpose, emotional intelligence, autonomy, gratitude, like so contrary to what I'm expecting to see, like, is that what you expected to find when you started this process? I know you started this yeah, that, oh, that's, a, that's actually a gr that's a fantastic question. And it, so let me back into it because no, I, I know not at the, not at the level. So I have always, um, I did not start out to be a great science communicator that was like, I liked neuroscience. I liked writing. I want to do fancy things with language along the way. I discovered I had this ability to communicate about really hard ideas really simply um, and it's mostly because I grew up in a blue collar town and I was a journalist and I was a bartender and I just like, I talked to everybody everywhere. And I always said, I, I don't usually, there are very few dumb people. There are people who speak different languages. And if you can figure out what language somebody speaks, they're probably really smart about something. Mm. And that's always been my philosophy as a journalist, as a bartender, whatever. And as a communicator, that's really important to me. That said, it's neuroscience. I was expecting, you know, much more razzle dazzle craziness. And I will say, so we've been doing, this is not in the book. It's, we, we hint at it towards the end, but we've been looking very, very hard at state onset. What happened in the first, in the brain in the first two seconds of flow? What are the neural dynamics of entry into flow? And at that level, usually complicated right? Usually complicated, but at the level of where you take that information and where do you interface with it, it's immensely practical. In fact, that's almost the biggest problem. The biggest problem people have with this information, and I'm sure you see this uh, with, your, uh, with your, your team and your groups uh, and your people, people really want something sexy, right? They want a biohack intervention that's going to get them late on Friday night yes. and help them win the tournament on Saturday morning. Right? Like they, that's what they want. And, um, and it turns out, um, you can have, you can't, you don't get both because the best interventions are psychological interventions, right? They're small tools. And second thing, want to talk about what you just, how we got to this question. 
of course these are the things you're talking about on your show, right? Peak perfor- there is peak performance, as I say in the book over and over, it's nothing more than getting our biology to work for us rather than against us. And that's a limited set suite of tools, right? And thus all peak performers, and I'm assuming if the podcast is called Chasing Excellence, that's your people, all peak performers who are getting anywhere, who have had any success whatsoever, this is the only, this is the way it gets done. Like there's no, there aren't other real choices around. There's a bunch of other stuff that you can spend a lot of time playing with, right? You can count your calories and weigh your celery and like, and do all that stuff. And you're going to get Which micro- our listeners do, by the way. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Of course. And lots of people, lots of people who I work with on a daily basis do that as well. And I'm not saying don't do that stuff, but I'm saying that that stuff is minimal returns compared to the really boring, dull psychological interventions that are really based on our biology. Okay, let me start. So I love that with the the biology aspect of this. Can we start from like the beginning, like from an evolutionary perspective, how is flow interweaved into who we are as human beings? Why is it a thing? And is it a thing? Is it, or is it something that like is reserved for the few? It is re- reserved for the Laird Hamiltons. It's reserved so, for the Elon Musks. I'll back into your question. One, one of the most well-established about flow, it, some facts about flow is it's universal. It shows up in anyone, anywhere, provided certain initial conditions were met. When me, I, I often called the godfather of flow psychology, was chairman of the University of Chicago Psychology Department conducted one of the largest global studies on alpha performance ever. He talked to everybody you could imagine. Why do we know flow is universal? Because he talked to Detroit assembly line workers and Navajo sheep herders and Italian grape farmers and elderly Korean women and Japanese teenage motorcycle gang members and expert rock climbers and neurosurgeons and stockbrokers and teachers. And I could keep going literally for like an hour. He talked to everybody and that has been repeated over and over and over again. Uh, In fact, when positive psychologists now define happiness, there are three levels of happiness available on earth. Level one is happiness. It's moment to moment. How do you feel right here, right now? And truthfully, there's not a whole lot you can do about that one. That one is sort of set up by early childhood experience, nature, nurture. And you have these things called emotional set points. This is the low. This is the high. Most of your life emotionally takes place in between. And you can move them, but not easily. The next level up is engagement. This is a high flow lifestyle, right? This is pretty much any athlete, right? Especially any athlete who's, who's, who's has another job where they're not a professional athlete all the time, right? That's a high flow lifestyle. I live in Tahoe. You used to live in Tahoe. How many people around here work construction jobs in the summer? They're kind of flowy because you're working with your hands and it's interesting, but so they could ski all winter or hunt all winter, right? These are high flow lifestyle. Um, Various studies have found that most people spend about 5 to 10% of their work life in flow, often without noticing. It's a low-grade flow state, what's known as microflow. But, you know, when you sit down to talk to your boss or whatever and you get lost in like an hour-long conversation and time, you know, goes by and you don't notice it. And maybe your sense of self didn't disappear and it wasn't all mystical one with everything. But your bodily awareness did. And like when you pop back in, you're like, oh crap, I got to piss. And you run to the bathroom. <laughs> we had, this happens to everybody all the time, right? That's a low grade flow state. What most people don't know is you can crank that up and turn that low grade flow state into deeper and deeper flow states and get bigger and bigger effects. And you can make it much more reliable and repeatable and useful and all that stuff. Mm. But no, flow is really common. And from an evolutionary perspective, to go back to your first question, now that I've said all that, there's Two theories. The first is, is, is pretty – so one, flow, flow uh, is not just humans. It appears to be most mammals. There was a study out of the University of Arizona Whoa. that thought, they thought the line was ferrets. So they, they, this is a great study. They took dogs, humans, and ferrets and taught them to run on treadmills until they got into runner's high. And then they measured anandamide levels, which is one of the chemicals that's underneath flow. It's one of the big painkillers that underpins runner's high and all that stuff also. And humans, dogs, but ferrets didn't seem to produce anandamide. Now, we now know that that's totally crazy because the system that produces anandamide is one of the oldest systems evolutionarily. And we've learned a lot more so that, but we definitely know it goes down to ferrets. <laughs> may go a lot deeper. Um, 
the original idea was it's painkiller. If you're running down your prey, right? If you can run a little longer, get a little more painkiller, you're going to get more meat. You're going to be healthier, longer survival, have more kids. That's an evolutionary driver and that's enough to kickstart something. What seems to have happened is that flow massively amplifies pattern recognition, our ability to detect nonverbal signals, ticks and tendencies, right? And Stealing Fire write a lot about the Navy SEALs using group flow, mostly because it's sort of like heightened nonverbal communication developed for crisis situations. So we co-evolved with wolves, meaning 40 to 50,000 years ago, humans teamed up with wolves. And this was a huge, huge leap forward for both of us. Hmm. Wolves taught us so, so many of our so-called humane traits, our cooperation, our patience, our willingness to take care of the old and the young, um, babysitting duties, sharing meals with family. These are not primate traits. Primates don't do those things. The general rule, primates are mean to each other and almost all of their intelligence, unless you're dealing with bonobos, are how to calm the other person out of something, sex or <sighs> food or whatever. They're not cooperative. They don't play fair. So a lot of people have said over a long time, it was the cohabitation with wolves that taught mm. us our so-called humanity. Actually, were things we learned from wolves. But the point is, we teamed up with wolves and started, they, they wanted our garbage piles. They would come into our camp, steal our garbage, you know, and less garbage, more health, survival benefit. The wolves that were less afraid of the humans, they started getting closer and closer. They became our bed warmers. Where do you think the phrase three dog night comes from? <laughs> it's a night so cold, you need three dogs in the bed to stay warm. That's what that is. And it comes from cohabitation with wolves. They became our babysitters, blah, blah, blah. But the big deal was we started pack hunting with wolves. Humans them by themselves, even with spears, can't take down giant, giant prey, but humans and wolves together can. If you've ever run, I run a dog sanctuary. I run in the back hundred of my dogs all the time. If you've ever run with a pack of dogs, you will trip all over each other. You just bash into each other. It's like mm. madness because nobody knows where they're going because there's not, there's no common language. But when you drop into flow and dogs drop into flow as well, Pattern recognition goes way up and you get immediate mm. pack coordination, mm. immediate. And you, if you think about evolutionarily, you can't fall down and cut yourself in prehistoric times. You get gangrene, you're going to die, right? Like there's, uh, there's zero margin for error because there's no health care really. So cohabitating with wolves, flow, social communication, this they think is what really drove it into our species, um, and why it underpins so much group flow, social communication, communitas, all these things. But there's a lot of thinking that so-called schooling in fish and flocking in burrs and those kinds of behaviors are also essentially flow states. Okay, that brings, who? Oh, um, okay. So we talked about endorphins for painkillers. You talk about that there's five neurochemistry brain, I don't know if it's hormones or there's, can you, t can you just, okay. um, yeah, yeah, let's, yeah. let's do this. Yeah. This doesn't yeah. have to be super hard. So when you want to talk about the brain, you only talk about four things. You talk about, uh, neurochemicals, which is what you've been talking about and neuroelectrical signals. These are just the two ways the brain talks to itself into the body. It either sends messages through chemicals or it sends messages through electrical signals. That's all that's going on there. Or you talk about neural anatomy, where in the brain something is taking place, right? You say the prefrontal cortex, that's a fancy word, but all it means is front of the brain, right? Center of the brain, it's a location. All those fancy words are just a spot because the brain is a three-dimensional object. It's hard to locate things. So networks is the other half of that equation because very rarely do things take place in one spot in the brain, right? There's no, this is the spot for memory or like, it doesn't work that way. It's a big network. So that's what you talk about. Neurochemicals are just signaling molecules. Hormones are signaling molecules that go into the body. Neurochemicals and neuromodulators stay in the brain. That's the big difference. It's the big difference, but hormones can emerge in the brain and then go into the body. But it's really about where you're sending your signals mostly. Um, and there are tons of neurochemicals involved in flow. The five you were referring to are all pleasure chemicals. So foundational ways we feel good. And the easiest 
way to explain this at a really basic level is using drugs. Because any drug in the real world, whether it's a pharmaceutical drug that's going to make you healthy or a, a psychedelic that's going to make you trip, they work because they bond to the same receptors that internal chemicals bond to. Mm. This is how we discovered neurochemicals. You mentioned endorphins. Endorphins came out of the heroin epidemic of the 60s. Vietnam happens and the heroin's everywhere in America and people are freaking out. Oh, crap. Whole country's addicted. Scientists ask the question, well, how the fuck did anybody get addicted? We're like heroin's like a 2,000-year-old drug. We're a 500 million year, you know, we're a 500,000 year old species or 200,000 years old. How did we get addicted to this substance? Like, how does it work? And they went looking and they found, oh, we've got these things that call them endorphins that are our natural version of heroin, right? Internal, um, internal endorphins and so forth. So when you talk about opiates, you're essentially talking about heroin, oxycotton, things like that. When you, if you feel like if you're relaxing on a warm like couch, like a soft, warm couch. If you feel that feeling, that's usually endorphins. That's usually how you know you've got endorphins in your system. Um, you get serotonin. That's the calming chemical. That's the heart of the Prozac revolution. We're all familiar with serotonin at this point. But serotonin is also the chemical that underpins LSD and MDMA as well. Um, dopamine, which is essentially cocaine in the real world. Norepinephrine, which is essentially speed in the real world. And uh, anandamide, which is psychoactive inside of THC. So if you smoke pot, this fancy word anandamide, that's mostly what's making you feel high. Um, and lit dead and painkilling and things like that. The most important thing to know is that the brain can do things that we can't do on the street. So one, if you tried to cocktail the street drug version of those substances, what would happen? You're dead or you're in a coma. It doesn't, it doesn't actually work. And literally it can't work because two of those chemicals uh, – dopamine or cocaine and uh, serotonin or MDMA, they cancel each other out. So mm. dopamine will always win, right? If you go, if you try to cocktail cocaine and MDMA, as people do, it doesn't work. The cocaine always wins. Mm. Um, but the brain can cocktail all this stuff, which is why when you say flow is the most pleasurable state on earth, the most addictive state on earth, or when McKinsey, the business consultancy, goes into the world and talks for 10 years to top executive CEOs and say, how much more productive are you in flow? And the answer comes back 500% more productive. These addictive pleasure chemicals that are responsible. And one thing, one last thing to know, our internal version, not only can we cocktail it better, it's a better drug. So there are about 20 different endorphins in the brain. The most common one, it's 100 times more potent than medical morphine. So these are really strong pain-killing chemicals and pleasure chemicals in our system. Does the – so when McKenzie goes and asks that question, do, when, do, I understand that people can know when they were in flow. Like mm. they get done with a – you yeah, get done yeah, with how, like a great ski it? run. Yeah, yeah. Like how do you, you come down it? from yeah. this amazing like powder and you're like, oh, my God. And you're like you, – it's like coming off a high. Totally. Does – so first is like how do you – yeah, how can you measure – like – I was in flow for this work day during this time. And the next is, does the actual, does the actualization of realizing you're in flow kick you out of flow? Because it's supposed to be this kind of like otherworldly state. Are you bringing a level of consciousness to it that kicks you out of it? Is it, is it like a, a light switch type thing? Or is it um, like a dimmer where you can like turn it up and turn it down? And you have two choices here. You can ask your questions one at a time, or you can tell me which of the three you want me to answer first. Uh, you're going to – this <laughs> – nope, can't I'm do that. Teasing you. I'm just teasing you. I'm can't just teasing that. you. I, I know. I know. I've noticed. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I cannot remember the first question you anymore. Neither can I. I. That's why okay. I can't do but it. But I will tell you the second – the answer to the second one. So – um. Shit. There's a big picture and a small picture answer. So the big picture answer is flow is not a binary state. It doesn't work like a light switch. You're not in the zone or out of the zone. It's actually a four-stage process, and there's big neurochemical shifts underneath each stage at macro level. You asked a second question about is flow a dimmer or a light switch? Like will a distraction pull us out of flow? Does recognizing we're in flow mean we're totally coming out? So – there's a lot of complicated answers to that particular question. Um, short answer is uh, you can get knocked out of flow. For example, there's a ton of work that's been done, not by us, but by other people on coders. And they found that coder, because coding is 
flow is foundational to writing great code. And so it's really important in the computer industry. Um, and there's a really good handbook on managing people in that industry called PeopleSoft that they did a study. And they found that coders get knocked out of flow by any interruption and they'll stay out for about 15 minutes. And then you can usually start to drop back in if you can get back in. Um, so there's some data on that, but you know this, this, you know that that's not true because you've been skiing and what happens? You ski in flow, you get in the chairlift and you're like, and right. then you realize kind of what's actually going on. And then you get back on the next run and you're back, back deep in the state again. So your own experience says, no, it doesn't work that way, but it also gets at something that's really important. It depends on the nature of the distraction. It depends on how you, so it is, if you start, the distraction is something uh, that will turn up anxiety, for example. This is why if you're in flow and you're transitioning between tasks and you want to maintain flow, right? Let's say you were in flow while writing something you had to do for work and your next task is a meeting and you want to stay into flow for that meeting. In the five minute break, you're going to take between tasks the last thing you want to do is, by the way, get on social media, mm. because if you have an emotional reaction to something, and if it, especially if it's a negative reaction, you start producing no, more norepinephrine and cortisol, the stress and anxiety portion mm. of hormones, that can totally kick you out of flow for sure. So there's the answer is um, this stuff is trainable and there's skills underneath, right? And the the better thing about noticing that you're in flow is if you know what you're doing, if you understand flow's triggers and how they work, you can notice that you're in micro flow and start cranking up the dial. In fact, um, when I notice that I'm in micro flow and I'm skiing, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I do knowing that I'm going to drop myself into a much deeper flow state. Like if I'm in, in a micro flow state on run three, there's a very specific protocol I'll go through on runs like four and five. If on run six, I want to go okay, do Okay, what is that? Like mechanistically, what is that? That's so cool. That's because I feel like here, here I go. I'm going <laughs> to have a hard time just cutting off. Okay, but Patrick, like hold on. The question was, how does the <laughs> triggers work mechanistically? Okay, because okay, I feel like the harder you <laughs> seek it, it's almost like seeking happiness. Like I want to like hold on and grab and be happy. It's all, is flow not just a a symptomatic thing of your environment of the situation you put yourself in? You're essentially saying you okay, can. Okay. Yeah. Now I remember your earlier question. Yeah. And so one, how does psychologists measure flow? That was where we started way back when. There are six core characteristics <laughs> to the state. I've mentioned some of them. There's complete concentration in the present moment. There's time dilation, the loss of our sense of time, the diminishment of our sense of self. There's a sense of control where you have control over things you don't normally have control over, or a sense of crap mastery that you don't normally have access to. A uh, couple others, including what's known as an autotelic experience, which is a fancy way of saying flow is the most addictive and pleasurable state on earth, et cetera, et cetera. So what psychologists do is they ask you in subject questionnaires in that experience you just had or are thinking about how much or how little of these six qualities showed up. And this is, there's four or five different diagnostics that are based around that. They're extremely well validated. They, they actually, I, for years, because I work on the neurobiology of this, I thought those, I was very suspicious of them. Over time, I have really come to believe it's a pretty good way of doing things. It's not what I want to do, but it's it's the best we're at. We are at the collective, the Flow Research Collective, are working very hard to create a biophysical flow detector, something that can measure neurological and physiological signals. Mm -hmm. And we've made massive advances, not we, the collective that we have, uh, we, the field. If flow, there are 17 different brain and body correlates that now mean flow, a simple one. Turns out your frowning muscles may be kind of paralyzed when you're in flow, which is not, by the way, that doesn't mean you can't be unhappy in flow. Frowning is a signal of effort. So flow is this sense of like effortless effort, right? That sense of control, you've been pushed by something bigger than yourself. We don't register, even though we're burning a tremendous amount of calories in flow, it's very energy expensive, we don't feel it, so we can't frown. And, and smile muscles, by the way, seem to be hyperactive in flow, which represents all those kind of pleasure chemicals. So 
there's neurological signals also, but like it's getting, it, we're really like getting a suite. We know what heart rate variability does in flow. We know what cortisol levels do in flow. We're really getting a good sense of this thing at this point. So how to put all those signals together in one device to measure whether or not people are in flow isn't possible today, but we really like, we, it, somebody's going to do it uh, in the next five years. We think it's going to be us, but somebody will do it in the next five years. Okay mechanistically run four through five, six, you're, you're getting, you're, yeah. you're doing okay. steps. Okay. To- okay. So let me just take you from the beginning. Maybe there's other athletes out there. You can, um, and I'll, and I'll, by the way, I'll, I'll then, this is what our you. listeners will love yeah. to, this I'll, is like, so we'll start with skiing one. and then I'm going to, I'm going to walk you into football. Cause I've done this. Like, I want to give you two radically different examples of how, of ways to do this stuff. So let's start big picture. Flow states have triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow. Flow follows focus. So what do the triggers do? Drives it. They drive our attention into the present moment. A couple of those triggers push neurochemicals in our system that tighten up focus. Uh, some of them lower cognitive load. Cognitive load is all the crap you're thinking about at any one time. And if I diminish it, right, what do I do? I liberate a bunch of extra energy for focus and attention. So that's what all the triggers do. Some of them do they put dopamine in, some push norepinephrine, some lower cognitive load, some do combinations, some, right, blah, blah, it doesn't matter. Drive focus into the now. One of the couple of triggers that are important. So risk is a big flow trigger. Dumb flow. Action sport athletes fuck up and go to the hospital because they try to use risk to get into flow. And I, like, I, this scar that goes from here to here, that's that. That's, oh, I'll just jump this 25-foot cliff and I'll be in flow all day afterwards. <laughs> and no, actually, I triggered an avalanche, nearly severed my hand from my thumb, from my wrist, and spent the next, you know, months in traction. <laughs> so no, dumb idea. You don't want to use risk as a way to get into flow. But you can also, not just physical risk, creative risk, emotional risk, social risk, psychological, all that stuff will work. But novelty complexity and unpredictability will also produce flow. It's why action sport environments are so packed with flow so much because they're packed with novelty, complexity, unpredictability, and risk. But the key is, um, and you and I, because we were both in squaw in the 90s, you had a ringside seat to the greatest assault on the impossible ever. And well, why was that? Why did action sports go so crazy in the 90s, right? Like what happened? It was creativity. And here's the point. So creativity, when you link ideas together in a new way, what's known as insight, you get a little burst of dopamine. You, we know this cognitively. If you've ever done a crossword puzzle or Sudoku, you get an answer right, you get that little rush of pleasure. That rush is dopamine. And interestingly, when you get dopamine in your system, it, all, it does this thing. It tunes, fancy way, it tunes signal to noise ratios. What does that mean? It means we know it detect way more signal in the noise, we detect more patterns. Earlier I said pattern recognition goes up. This is why it's these neurochemicals working. What that means is creative ideas and creative insight will produce dopamine and that will amplify creativity, which will lead to another creative insight, Mm. which will produce more dopamine, so they spiral. So what, you have to take advantage of this in action sports. So run one, it's just getting your body. You know what I mean? And mostly about start getting used to, if you're a skier or a snowboarder, this will work for downhill mountain biking as well, any of the gravity sports. The first thing you want to do is get, a, is get a sense of the speed. Our body has a hard time remembering the speed with which action sports move at. Unless you're doing it every day, that's a, there's a kinesthetic memory. So there's a governor that says, don't go that fast. It's too, right. It takes a while. Like, you know, in ski season, you usually don't start skiing at full speed till like day 10 to 12. Cause it takes a while for your body to go, Oh wow. It's okay. I can, I can, I don't die at 40 miles an hour. Oh wait, I don't die at 45. Oh wait, I don't die at 50. Right. Like, but it does, it takes a little while for us to remember that runs one and two are all about getting used to the speed and just warming up the body. Run three, that's you're probably warming up, up enough to really start to move the body. So that's when you'll go for moguls or something that's really going to force you to get deep into your body. Now, this is going to start to work in your benefit flow-wise because deep embodiment, the engagement multiple senses at once, 
drives attention into the now. So when the, the terrain gets really uneven and you need a lot of kinesthetic awareness to steer around it, <laughs> that grabs hold of a lot of attention. So run three, and if you're not yet warmed up, do it again and run four. Now remember, we're aiming to be doing something gnarly and run six or seven. Like that's when you're gonna go take your giant risk and try to level up. So what do you wanna do in between? Couple of options, but the easiest is for run four to creatively interpret the terrain. Go find a easy intermediate slope and look at every single feature and say, oh, there's a little hill there. It will throw my weight left and I can use it to spin this way or to put a little turn in, that sort of thing. When we look at the terrain and then execute with our body, that's a form of pattern recognition. That's the, that's pattern, the same thing as producing an insight reaction. If you get a bunch of those in a row, you're, get, you're starting to amp up more and more and more dopamine. And the point here, big lesson, uh, I don't know if this story is in Art of Impossible, but it should be if it's not. Um, first flow hack I ever learned, and I learned it from Glenn Plake. Do you remember Glenn Plake? Oh, yeah, Ski. Mohawk. Yeah. So Glenn and I, uh, we were doing a story back in the early Wizard 90s. of Oz. Yeah, exactly. Glenn's a super nice guy, brilliant skier, and a like just really smart guy. But back in the uh, middle 90s, we were skiing up on Mount Hood in the upper chutes above the <coughs> glacier. <coughs> and it's gnarly up there. It's scary up there. And Glenn... We're like at the top of this, you know, there's death fall cliffs on either side. You just don't want to screw up. And Glenn backs up like 60 feet, skates in hot and throws a giant airplane turn into the chute. So he jumps up in the air and he turns 180 degrees and he drops into the chute. And I skied down with him at the end and I was like, Glenn, what, what the hell are you doing? Like, why would you do something dumb and dangerous before we're going to do something dumb and dangerous? He said, no, 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 you don't get it. He's like, I'm doing that because that weightlessness at the top, something about it always drops me into the zone. And so by the time I land, I'm already in flow. And my every, what is that? A little bit is deep in body, but, but it's basically a kinesthetic, a body version of novelty, complexity, unpredictability. Weightlessness, we're gravity bound creatures. So when you encounter and an airplane turn is safe weightlessness, all he's doing is jumping up and turning 180 degrees and landing in something he does all the time. He was doing it into a chute, but he was doing a move that he knew he could do because the weightlessness. So those are the same kinds of things you want to take advantage of on runs four and five to drive yourself deeper and deeper into the zone. And it's this, it's the same thing. Like I'm having a ski day where I'm trying to really step up my game and do something hard and it's not going well. Like I'm skiing laps on something that's just kicking my butt. I will dial it back. I'll go to something much mellower and I'll start creatively interpreting the terrain because I'm not yet in, right? I'm not in the zone where I can kind of attack my best. So how does, what does this look like in football? So there was, I was, I was working with a bunch of different college coaches and the question was, we know uh, that they, they want to know two things. One, if they could get their players into flow before practice started, they thought injuries would go down in practice, um, which is probably very, very true, which is, it turned out to be true. And obviously, learning massively increases in flow. In research run by the U.S. Department of Defense, the DOD, they found soldiers in flow learn 240% faster than normal. So if you're trying to install plays, right? You've got four or five days to install plays and you don't want to get anybody hurt, but that got a practice flows. So what we started to do is it was so dumb, but so easy. Every coach in the world has players run a couple of laps around the field to start practice, right? It's your, it's the standard football warm up, And all we did is say, okay, let's make them into obstacle courses and let's take the big guys and have them run on trails and, you know, if the big guys don't want to run as far as the lighter guys, have them really interpret the terrain on the trails. And the lighter guys, same thing. Same thing I was doing in runs three, four, and five with the skiers. We started doing with the football guys before they actually got into practice. And over time, most of the coaches who were doing it, you know, there was a lot of pushback from like, you know what I mean? Telling an offensive lineman that as you're like warming up, you know, you should be doing forward somersaults. You know what I mean? The creatively, they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know what I mean? Like, and I, I don't blame them, but the results were really cool. And, um, and also engagement went up. 
right? It was fun. It's novel. It's people were happy or at practice. Led Love to more group cohesion. Yeah, I'm gonna um, take a second just quickly start and work through that from uh, from our audience perspective that do mm-hmm. these CrossFit things. Um, just draw draw some parallels. The the I forget what you called it, but the um, the getting used to the speed. I'm not going to die. So in our world, that's getting your heart rate up. So what we do for our athletes is we don't just jump into what we call our Metcon or the really hard workout. You get on a treadmill, you get on an assault bike, you play with a ski erg, you, and you generally get yourself up used to this, um, we're actually not, not the flow state, but you're actually getting your, your body to flow and getting your uh, muscles warmed up. It's all the general physical uh, I, know what a cross, I know what a CrossFit workout is. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm good. So from there, once we do that, then I, I really like the, the next two phases, which you can kind of play back and forth, which is challenge yourself, but then also um, the, the creative interpretation of the terrain aspect. So what we can do there is um, start lifting some weights. But then I really like the idea of backing off a little bit to get yourself – to feel confident and comfortable. So I think what a lot of people do is they just start, and this is what every, this whether you're Olympic I athlete, for, yeah, I did and it for you just years. climb and climb just and go, climb go, and go. climb and climb. Yeah. But there's, there's, a, there's wave training, which is you work up and then you come back and you work up again and you come back and you work up and you come back. That's a really um, slick way to kind of, I think, hack flow, which is like, I'm gonna challenge myself, I'm gonna get comfortable again. I'm gonna challenge myself to get comfortable again. And then what you'll see with these elite athletes, what they'll do, Katrin, so Stephen, I don't know if you know it, but Katrin's, um, uh, she, I'm her coach and I work with her and she's won world's fittest athlete a couple of times. She kicks up on her hands and she's probably working with gravity, interpreting the train. Yeah, by the something way, that same, feels comfortable. Yeah, same yet thing. challenging Hand, and new. Handstands are fantastic. Handstands, yes. Yeah, handstands. Same with, um, I've done Ashtanga yoga for about 25 years at this point, and any of the balance moves in Ashtanga, right, where you're upside down, anything, because we're, again, gravity-bound creatures, right? So any, so with what really works is G-force, uh, polyaxial rotation, multiple Gs, mm-hmm. polyaxial rotation, so spinning, being upside down. Anytime you're moving around your center, basically, dynamically, even if it's like a handstand, that kind of stuff, or as gravity-bound creatures, your brain goes, what the fuck? You're upside down now. Hey, wait a minute. We should pay attention. Instant mm-hmm. focus. Love it. Okay. So that, um, there's always this fine line between like where the learning zone is, right? You talk about learning a lot in this book and there's this blend between zone is effortlessness or the sense of not putting a lot of effort in, thus not the frowny face. But then there's also this necessity for struggle. Like there's this necessity to push your boundaries. There's a necessity for risk. How do we blur that line? How do we know where to live our lives? How do we know where that is? Great question. And the answer is often talked about as the golden rule of flow. Flow states have trigger. Trigger is the most important one is what's known as the challenge skills ratio. We pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge of the task at hand slightly exceeds our skill set. So you want to stretch but not snap. And for your audience, so for shyer, quieter, meeker people, this is problematic because that sweet spot is just outside your comfort zone. You got to push yourself right outside your comfort zone. That's the same thing, by the way, you're doing in your warmups, right? You're getting, you're resetting the body's homeostatic level, right? This has been your energy input, output so far today. We're gonna give you a new normal. We're gonna make it much higher. In the beginning, it sucks. And then two to three, four or five minutes in, six minutes in, you're like, oh, this is a new normal. I got this, I can do this, right? That's all of our experience. That's what's happening. We're basically resetting the body's thermostat and it's freaking unpleasant until it gets reset. And that's the same thing with the challenge skills sweet spot. But for the shyer folks, you're gotta be uncomfortable, be uncomfortable. The problem for go-getters is that spot percentage-wise, this number isn't real, but it's been tested a lot and it holds up. The sweet spot is about 4% greater than your skill level. So when the challenge is about 4% greater than your mm-hmm. skill level, 
that's the zone. The problem with peak performance with that's the top not a guys, lot. That's yeah, that's the point. Is it's yeah, not especially a lot. in our community, yeah, which people just not, go to they no, blow up. They they your community they go to they blow yes. up. And so here's the this is very sports specific thing. Um, when we t- the chick sent me high and a, and a Google mathematician came up with that four percent number, and they were said it was look, it's a metaphor. This is not real. They did a back of the envelope calculation. Yep. We took that number and went okay, let's just test it for the fuck of it. Like what can we learn? And I did the coolest thing that got done was at Angel Fire Bike Park where we measured every one of the jumps. So we could, at the start of the season, we said, okay, you're comfortable on a 12 foot gap jump and you're comfortable on a 15 foot tabletop or your blah, blah, all that stuff. So we could start to measure increments and how much you push and blah, blah. And we just, it was still wasn't the best. I, we've never published it. It's not a real study. I mm-hmm. still don't think it's real science. I just think it's more information, but what we found is the coolest thing in the world. When people stay in that 4% sweet spot, you I don't know if this happens in CrossFit, but in skiing, mountain biking, whatever, you know, the start of the season, there's like two or three days, four days, where you're just sort of getting used to the, the speed, the work, the effort, but then you get a couple of really deep flow states that basically show you a whole new level of performance that might be possible for you, and then you spend about three months learning to do all that shit without the flow, and then you get another deep, then you leveled up and you get another deep flow state that shows you what's next, right? And that's the, that's most of the process of athletic improvement for most people most of the time. Unless we did what we did, where you stay in that 4% sweet spot, which most of the time required me to back off my natural instincts. Mm-hmm. I wasn't, it wasn't that I right. wasn't pushing hard enough. It was, I literally had to come way back. And what I discovered is, and what most of the people in the study group discovered is that there was no plateau. You kept getting flow state after flow state after flow mm, state after awesome. flow state, and there wasn't a plateau. And the level of um, progress you would make over like the course of a season was unlike anything anybody had made. Like it was the craziest thing in the world. But there's a you know there's a saying in in, in especially cognitive peak performance, which is you got to go slow to go fast, right? It's just what a, a lot of what this is. Flow is a huge turbo boost, but a lot of the stuff that you have to do to get into flow requires slowing things down, right? An active recovery protocol, not a passive recovery protocol. That's a enforced way of slowing things down, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the, so the answer to your question is the challenge skill sweet spot, but let's not kid ourselves. It's not a fixed thing, right? How tired are you today? It's going to go up or down. How did you eat the night before? It's going to go up or down. Did you get in a fight with your wife, girlfriend, cat, brother, right? It's going to go up or down. All those things mutate based on internal signals, not what you did in the gym yesterday, right? You can't, you can't do that, right? It's not, it doesn't work like as much as it's nice to be like, oh, I, I lifted, you know, 220, I benched 225 yesterday. I'm going to bench 230 today, right? That'll be a 4%. Well, no, of course it doesn't work that way. (laughs) Right. If all things are equal, yeah, maybe. But yeah, but it's four percent above your threshold, not above your max. So if your max is two twenty-five, your threshold, the sweet spot, the learning zone, is usually about eighty-five percent. So if you play in that eighty-two to eighty-eight percent, which is check out Chinese weightlifting, the best in the world, they live there. Then what the, you're saying is, which I totally agree with he or she who spends the most time at threshold wins. So yes. you, what you're trying to do is not move your max up. You're not bumping up against the edges of the yeah. room. So I'll, you're let's playing put it away. I'll the- give you, I'll give you, I'll give you weightlifting for my own life. I just, when I was 23 years old, I weigh 150 pounds, by the way, when I was 23 years old, the bat, I was benching 225, 10 times and I could Whoa, do it. Comfortably. That's pretty good. I that decided that's really good. I decided at age 50, I'm now 53 that I was going to get back there. And um, I have not managed to put up 225 10 times, but I have gotten up to four or five. And then usually either ski season or some kind of injury <laughs> gets in the way. I'm so goddamn close. But what I did differently this time, the first time it took me forever to get there because I was playing with my max. Yeah. Was fu- right? right. Now I live at 185. I live with the plates and the quarters, right? That's where I'm doing most of my work, most of the time. In fact, I don't even try to, if I max once every two months now to check out where I am, that's probably about what it is. There it is. Um, Okay, so 
we've talked about flow for optimal performance. We've talked about that. It's the way to impossible. You have a cool story about um, you had you got Lyme disease pretty early on. Um, we live in the Northeast where Lyme is a big thing. And you talk about your your experience surfing and how that um, helped massively. Do you see – so the second part, I, I love high, super high elite performance from the – what are we able to do from a work capacity standpoint? The second part of me, it loves – kind of not the biohacking longevity play, but just like this, this health aspect. I understand flow from a psychological perspective, how that can be so beneficial. Like you, you, you oh, let me, yeah, let but, me, but let from me, a physical, so, like chronic yeah, disease me, yeah, let, type yeah, thing, so can, can it cure? Things. So cure is a strong word. Let me tell you what ha- why, what happened. So I did cure my Lyme disease, chronic Lyme. I was in bed for three years. I was very fucked up. Um, with surfing and the flow that it produced. So my, and I got into this work at a deeper level to solve that puzzle of why the hell did that happen? And what I learned, and this is not my work, it started the first person I saw I worked on, it was Herb Benson at Harvard, but a ton of people have worked on it since. He, he was the first guy to map the, the neurochemistry underneath flow and, and he realized two things. So one, I had Lyme disease. A Lyme disease is an autoimmune condition, which is your nervous system going haywire. When you move into flow, uh, there is a global release of nitric oxide in your system. So, you know, when you're working out, the 20 minutes in your lungs start to expand and you're like, oh, wow, I can breathe now. Everything opened up. It's nitric oxide. Yeah, that's nitric oxide that's doing that. What it's doing is it's pushing all the stress hormones out of your system and it's replacing them with dopamine, anandamide, the feel good, right? So when you have a nervous system going haywire, it can't find homeostasis. It doesn't know where normal is at all, right? This is what chronic Lyme, chronic fatigue, um, all those things, one of the reasons they last so goddamn long is your body doesn't know what homeostasis is anymore, because it can't find it because it's been so erratic for so long. That's the new normal. And by flushing all the, all the stress hormones out, it resets the nervous system. It tells the body this is zero. Even better, all those same neurochemicals massively boost the immune system. So Herb Benson argued in his book, The Breakout Principle, that this mechanism, this flow-based healing mechanism we're talking about, he thinks it's the mechanism under many of the so-called cases of spontaneous healing. He thinks this is, this is what mm. we're looking at. Um, it's certainly very prevalent in the anecdotal literature. Um, and there's been, his work was 2000-ish, 2005, I would say. Um, so much work has been done on neural immunology and flow since then. So there's a lot, there's an, this is an accumulating pile of data. Um, it's not, you know, it's probably not the number one reason you want way more flow in your life. But um, I will tell you personally, the more flow I'm experiencing, the less sick I get, mm. right? That's, for, that's, damn, that's damn true um, for me and I probably for a lot of other people as well. Um, for all these reasons. So there's big health consequences. There's lots of psychological consequences. I mean, it's optimal performance, right? Like, like it's a, technically defined as optimal performance for a reason. It optimizes the entire system. Okay. Um, I, I would kick myself if I didn't ask this last question because it is just something I'm so curious. Um, and, and having someone like yourself on the show, um, the accelerated technology side of this, like to, like skipping out of flow state for a second, because you've written a bunch of other books about where the, uh, whether you call it futurism or where we're going, where, what are, what are you most excited about where we're going in maybe the next 10 years, whether it's flying cars or, um, you know, hacking human health or what, what do you see as the next big moves? Um, and what are you most personally excited about? Um, so, in my new book, my not the art impossible, go back one. It's called the future is faster than you think. It looks at um, what's going to happen 
in every major 11 biggest business sectors on earth ever uh, plots what's going to happen over the next 10 years. Short version, Ray Kurzweil, best profit of the future we've ever had in terms of his prognostication abilities. He has written considerably that we are going to experience 20,000 years of technological change over the 21st century. This means in the next 80 years, we're going birth of agriculture to the industrial revolution twice, <laughs> twice, <laughs> right? It means over the next 10 years, we're going to see about 100 years of technological change. So think back to 1920. Think mm -hmm. about the technologies that existed in 1920. Fast forward getting 100 out of, years Getting today. out of rail, like railroads right. and Model T cars. and That's by 2030, maybe 2030, 31, 32. Mm -hmm. That's how much change we're coming at. So put that so, in perspective. What is, what is that? Because I think that's hard for a lot. It's hard for me to grasp. What does that mean? Because that's... Right, this is not a quick answer, but I'm going to give you a simple... Let's just take one sector. Let's take transportation because you Love mentioned it. flying cars, yeah. right? So flying cars are coming. And, what, they're, oh, they're, they're not calling them flying cars though. What is it? Aerial, um, aerial, aerial, aerial transportation. I've heard, I've heard a bunch of different things. I don't know why we're not calling them flying cars. I think <laughs> flying cars are a cool ass name. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so just to put flying cars in perspective so people know, because this is the forever fantasy, right? Like, where right. the hell is my Jetsons. flying car? Where's right. The, the, the so Back to the Future 2. That uh, was supposed what to be is five years what ago. It, what is happening now and the reason it's happening now and the acceleration is accelerating is because over the past 10 years, we've had technologies hopping on the back of exponential growth curves. Moore's Law, when you double in power over a rate on a regular basis, there's – 17, 18 different technologies accelerating this quickly. Sensors, networks, computers, nanotechnology, biotech, I got on and on. They're starting to intersect. They're starting to converge, mm. right? That's what it is. And when you what hap when that happens, you're getting a whole as great as some parts effect. That's what flying cars are. Flying cars are everywhere right now. Every major aerospace manufacturer, most major car companies, there's a hundred different flying car companies right now. First actual commercially available flying car launched a month ago, so they're here. Uber wants flying car ride sharing services active in Dallas, Dubai, LA, a couple other cities by 2023, 2024. So this is coming to a city flying near you. Flying cars. Flying car. In the next Uber. three to four years. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Commercially um, available. Commer oh, they're commercially available now. Um, I've ridden in one. Like, they're, they're, they're here, they're available now, and they're the ultimate convergent technology. It's a giant robot. Flying cars are drones scaled up, right? So you've got robotics. They're AI piloted. Humans can't fly those things. They're, the motors are spinoffs of the solar industry plus battery technology spinning off the solar industry. The material, there's a material science revolution to make cars that are light enough to fly and durable enough. They're 3D printing most of the parts in these cars. And I could go on and on. So this is the ultimate convergent technology. And there's a big deal for really foundational stuff. These cars do 150 miles an hour. They're capable of 300 hours, 300 wow. miles of continuous flight. They can carry five, six passengers at a time. This is a transportation revolution, but that's not the point. If that was just the story, well, that'd be cool. That's a revolution probably as big as like the automotive revolution or right. But it's one of seven transportation technologies. Hyperloop, the high speed trains that go 700 miles an hour that are going to connect Los Angeles to Las Vegas. It's a 20 minute trip. There are 25 Hyperloop projects globally right now. Elon Musk is, has pointed out the same rockets he's using to launch satellites, the reusable rockets. They do 17,500 miles an hour. They could take you from New York to L.A. or Shanghai in 22 minutes. And he wants to use them for terrestrial travel by the end of the decade. We have every major automotive company is putting out autonomous cars right now. Fleets mm -hmm. of them are already rolling out. And there are like four other technologies that are coming that are just like this. My point is you want to know what's changed. I want to know what's the same. <laughs> My point is think about really basic questions. So uh, if you in, live in L.A., how big is the size of the local dating pool if you can go to Vegas in 20 minutes? 
right? Normally, you won't go out past Sherman Oaks because the 405 traffic just <laughs> sucks, right? And if she lives past four, 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 Sherman Oaks or he lives past there, you're not going to go because it's a pain in the ass to be on the freeway that much. And, you know, but suddenly people in New York date people in Brooklyn all the time. It's a train right away. It's 20 minutes, done. Suddenly that's Vegas. How big is the local school district? Mm. Let's say you live, right? You've got a flying car and you, you know, live in Detroit and you don't like any of the schools in and around Detroit, but, you know, an hour away, a hundred miles away, would you send your kid, right? These kinds of questions. So the point is that as convergence increases, the size and the scale of disruption goes up. So what we used to see was we would see it at the level of like markets, Right, you would see products, services, and markets were being disrupted by new technology. Craigslist comes along and it decimates advertising, right? And that's a it's a market level intervention. Um, what we're seeing now is institutions. We're seeing at at, at in and whole systems that underpin the institutions. The entire education system is going to be revamped over the next five years because it's going to go digital and it's going to be VR delivered and it's going to be AI sculpted to individually learning. You asked what excites me the most. This is what we're working on. VR is very good for producing flow. So if you couple mm -hmm. artificial intelligence to VR, you get something really interesting. Um, so also remember flow massively amplifies learning. So <laughs> we are working on VR-based high-flow learning environments that are AI-driven, meaning they're individually customized to each learner's needs. We're doing this for worker retraining. For example, we're going to have autonomous trucks everywhere by the end of the decade. Trucking is the largest employer in America right now. It's the largest blue-collar employer in America. Every one of those truckers needs a new job by early 2030s. And we need to retrain them very, 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 very quickly. For example, what's the best way possible? An AI-driven VR high-flow accelerated learning environment. This is also a, the new school platform. And we're not the only people working on this. There are a bunch of people working on you know, a lot of different versions of this. I'm not using – I don't want to turn mine into an educational platform um, because I don't want to get into a curriculum fight with parents but somebody else will, you know what I mean? Go, go take my thing or take and go have that battle. I don't want to have that battle because I just think it's annoying. It's not the best use of my time, <laughs> but for a lot of other people, it's great. And so that's, what's really, I mean, what's exciting me is, oh, wow, we're going to be able to drop people into flow and much more easily in much more focused directed ways that really kind of impact peak performance. So that's what I think. That is, uh, I think, as good a place as we're ever going to find to uh, wrap this conversation up, even though I think you just opened I up could a go giant for, I wormhole could go for forever. us. I, yeah, yes. seriously. Um, Stephen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your work. Uh, the new book is called The Art of Impossible. You can get it anywhere you get your books. Where's the best place, Stephen, for, uh, other than the new book, other than all the books, where's the best place if folks want to kind of dive more into the work that you do? Is it Flow um, Collective? Flow, flowresearchcollective.com is all the flow stuff. StephenCotler.com is me. And both places, there's big video pages. So like there's so much free content out there. And a couple things for your listeners because uh, it's useful. Flowblocker.com, www.flowblocker.com. There are six major, not just dis interruption, there are six major flow blockers. Disrupt, Distraction and interruption is one. Um, we've just built a diagnostic. And there's a toolkit attached to the back end. So if you want to increase the flow amount of flow in your life and you want a fast place to start, flowblocker.com. It's a free diagnostic, probably really useful to your, your folks. Awesome. And when Ben gets a flying car, we'll come out and see you again. Uh, we'll have another conversation. Ben, I would love that. Come ski. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, that's that's what you're. Th I was thinking, like, oh my gosh, you're talking about school. It's like I could go. <laughs> Ben's just runs like I can get to the I can get to the mountain. Twenty two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I don't even want to talk about what flying cars do for the action sports world. I've been so but for a tourism dear, in general, it becomes like your, your a, teleportation. A dear friend of mine is the inventor of the first flying motorcycle. And in fact, the blueprints, this was another impossible, right? So people said it couldn't be done. The blueprints were unrolled first in my living room back when I was living in L.A. 20 <laughs> years ago. Um, literally, um, 
you know, hair on fire guy comes in. He's like, I've invented the world's first flying motorcycle. <laughs> sure you have. Absolutely. <laughs> Take a number. Now it turns out actually he had, but, um, you know, uh, but when we were originally doing it, he, and he still, it, it hasn't, it hasn't quite happened, but it's now totally possible. I said, you got to make me a surfboard carrier. Cause I'm freaking dying trying to like, you know, three hours of traffic to get to the waves in the morning. And, you know, I, like, I, I couldn't do it. It's ultimately why I left California is I, you can't get to the beaches. Mm. Um, so that was, I was like, I have to go back to the mountains cause they're, you're fucking with my flow. <laughs> your car, your cars are between me and my flow, man. That's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Stephen, I'm going to jump in before Ben asks you another question. So have a great day. Thank you so much. Uh, and we'll see everybody next week on another episode of Chasing Excellence. You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.